Buenas tardes, bienvenidos. Somos el equipo de soporte técnico y vamos a dar unas breves indicaciones sobre el funcionamiento de la plataforma en cuanto a la interpretación simultánea. En esta reunión contaremos con interpretación inglés-español. En la parte inferior, en la barra de funciones, podremos visualizar el botón de interpretación representado por un mundo con las siguientes cuatro opciones. Apagado, inglés, español y silenciar audio original. Sí, paro esto. Seleccionamos el idioma de nuestra preferencia en el que queramos escuchar y ahí permanecemos durante toda la reunión. Es importante silenciar el audio original para no escuchar los dos idiomas al mismo tiempo. ¿Todos han encontrado el botón y seleccionado el idioma? Por favor, es muy importante que todos permanezcan en el idioma que van a escuchar durante toda la reunión para que tengan una mejor experiencia con la interpretación. Es también importante no dejar la función de interpretación en off. Nosotros estaremos presentes durante toda la reunión. Cualquier duda o inconveniente con la plataforma y sus funciones, puedes escribirnos de manera privada en el chat a InterRCI y con gusto te brindamos la atención necesaria. Iniciamos. Okay, uh, good good afternoon to everyone. Good, good evening to uh, Dr. Hafesi and welcome everybody and good evening for whoever is in the other side of the world. Today we have a great webinar uh, on corneal biomechanics, new concepts on cross-linking and sub-400 protocol. We are very happy to have Dr. Uh, Farhad Hafesi Uh, giving us this webinar. Uh, next slide, please. Can we go to the next? Thank you. So uh, we will start with the presentation by Dr. Hafesi, and then we will have a, a good time for all the questions, answers, and a good discussion. And this will be coordinated by our cornea specialist, Dr. Denise Pincus. Next one, please. So it's a pleasure to have a real expert on cross-linking. It's an honor to have Dr. Farhad Hafesi here with us. Dr. Hafesi is the director of the ELSA Institute and in Dieticon, Switzerland. He's a professor at the University of Geneva and also uh, it's a part of the research group leader at the University of Zurich in uh, Switzerland. He's also a adjunct a clinical professor at USC in Los Angeles. And Dr. Hafesi, uh, as I mentioned, he's a world expert on cross-linking and therefore he has published a lot on uh, cross-linking, corneal biomechanics. So uh, we, we really look forward and thank you, Dr. Hafesi, for being with us today. And we know it's a little bit late in Switzerland, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big honor to have you here. And uh, we will start uh, sharing your screen uh, to start the presentation. And uh, we'll also look forward for the uh, session of answer and uh, question and answers at the end of your presentation. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much, Dr. Shayet. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be with you tonight. Um, I'm looking forward to the discussion after the presentation.
Hello, this is Farhad Safezi from the Elsa Institute, Switzerland. And now these are my financial interests for this topic. Let's start with coordinate cross-linking the way you know it. That's an old video, but very nicely filmed by Swiss television. It must be about 15 years old, how it all started. And we know that nowadays, coronal cross-linking has become a global standard of care. You will have approximately, that's an estimate, 200,000 procedures performed every year. And Medline has a very solid uh, database of knowledge on coronal cross-linking technology. The first uh, device was built in uh, 2004 in Zurich and has ever since uh, been uh, followed by a number of uh, first and second generation uh, further CXL devices. But this is how it all started with the famous Tristan protocol, 3 milliwatts for 30 minutes. Now, since the introduction of coronal cross-linking, um, the keratoconus treatment has evolved very nicely and you will find a number of studies showing that in countries with a central registry for keratoplasty like the Netherlands or the UK, the number of keratoplasties performed on keratoconus dropped by roughly 50% since CXL technology was introduced. So you detect early, you treat early and you do not go as far as you uh, need to go into keratoplasty. For coronal infection, as you will see later on, very exciting new developments. Our multicenter trial has uh, just come to an end and the results are very promising. In ulcers up to four millimeters, we are similar to antimicrobials, so to medication. But let's uh, go back a little bit and let's look at our initial vision, which was to not only propose coronal cross-linking to those few percent of the world's population that have access to modern infrastructure, but to bring the technology to the slit lamp to cater both to modern developed countries and to developing countries. Now, thinking about this, a number of obstacles have to be overcome. If you think about the main indications of keratoconus, so ectasia and infectious keratitis, Let's start with CXL for keratoconus. We all know now that the Dresden protocol EpiOff works very well, but the slightly accelerated 9 milliwatts for 10 minutes EpiOff protocol works really well too. It, clinically, it shows the same efficacy as the Dresden protocol in a number of studies. And 10 minutes are absolutely feasible at the slit lamp, as you will see later. This is one point. Uh, so the acceleration that still respects enough oxygen to rediffuse in EpiOff works just nicely in 10 minutes, which of course is much easier uh, to do at the slit lamp than 30. Another more recent development is that finally, finally, we are getting to EpiOn crosslinking for keratoconus that indeed is working well. And the way it it came to this development was a combination of, and I call it an intelligent combination of factors, because what has been tried in the past, pulsed light, slow irradiation, higher fluids, was not enough to allow for functional epion alone. And so some groups even started using um, high oxygenation. So some technologists say you need to do an oxygen boost, but there is a way to perform epion using normal air, no additional oxygen, in a functional way. And this is not just uh, nice thinking, this is published data with a follow-up of three years. That's our friend Cosimo Mazotta, who has developed a protocol that combines normal room air, so no oxygen boost, 18 milliwatts for 13 minutes, so it's a pulse protocol to allow for more oxygen diffusion. It is accelerated, but only gently. It is high fluence, 7.2 joule instead of 5.4, and riboflavin transport is, is being given by and assured by iontophoresis. So we have epion that works. Now, if you think about this, 
look into uh, the very near future and we will do this protocol is also already integrated at this in the ci device for the slit lamp application so you can perform ipi on at the slit lamp in 13 minutes and you will see later that 13 minutes is absolutely no problem at the slit lamp now this is keratoconus just in a nutshell now if we go to puck cross linking i would perform puck cross linking in every ulcer let me show you why First of all, when the whole cross-linking era started, we thought that we induce stiffening of the cornea and that's it. So one effect, stiffening. And that's, of course, very good for keratoconus. It's beneficial. But besides stiffening, three more effects occur in every single cross-linking procedure. Whether you call it CXL or PAC-CXL, it's the same parameters. And besides stiffening, you induce steric hindrance, which means enzymatic digestion is harder. You induce RNA-DNA intercalation with the photoactivated riboflavin and a lot of oxidative stress. So when you perform a keratoconus treatment, you induce four effects, not only effect number one. Effect number one is very important for keratoconus, but you also slow down digestion and you kill everything in that cornea. So at the end of a keratoconus CXL procedure, the cornea is sterile. And that's another reason for me to take it to the slit lab. But effects number two, three and four are more important even in infectious keratitis. Effect number two means that you hinder digestion and effects number three and four mean that you kill unspecifically. And you do not only kill bacteria, you kill bacteria and fungi at the same time. And this is very important because as doctors, we all know how difficult it can sometimes be to establish the right diagnosis. Is this a bacterial infection? Is it a fungal infection? Is it a mixed infection? The diagnosis, of course, changes in a major way your therapy. And we all know that corneal swaps and scrapes sometimes do not give us a hint. So again, CXL, PAC CXL in this case, kills both. And this is a paper published from our group this year. Um, the, um, this is a bacterial strain. And this is an outlook into the future because, as you can see, the higher you go with the total energy, the higher the killing rate goes up to almost 100%. And in most of the studies you have read about in the past 10 years on puck cross linking, we were working with 5.4 joule. And now more recently, we went to 7.2, even to 10 joule. And you can see what happens. Efficacy goes up a lot. So we have a lot of room to make puck cross linking even stronger. And as I said before, um, puck cross linking increases the resistance to digestion. What does this mean? It means that the final scar will be smaller. With an antibiotic or an antifungal, you kill the bacteria or the fungus, but the inflammation and the digestion of tissue still goes on. Here, with puck cross linking, you kill and you strengthen the tissue. So what we have done in our latest effort, which took us almost four years, um, was a phase three study using high fluence, as you can see in the upper right, 7.2 joule. This was our prospective randomized multicenter controlled trial. And we compared ulcers up to four millimeters, either only with medication or only with puck cross linking, accelerated and high fluence. And the results were just astonishing. They are highly significant in the sense that we know now what is happening in this cornea. The days to healing are, there is no difference, there's no significant difference in the days to healing, and there's no significant difference in the success rate. So, puck cross linking alone, a single application of riboflavin and UVA is just as effective as many days and even weeks of antimicrobial medication. And we had bacterial, fungal, and mixed infection in this study. So no significant difference, which means that one single treatment gives you as much success rate as medication. And what will the future bring? As you can see, this is 7.2 Joule. 
we start using tangible now, which is still perfectly fine with this cornea. Remember, even in keratoconus, we go to 10, even 15 joule, and the keratoconus cornea is more transparent. There is more UV light reaching the deeper structures. Here, you have an opacified cornea, so the endothelium is, is even more protected from the UV light. This was a quite nasty fungal infection that had been treated by our Swiss colleagues, uh, um, Tamer Tandogan and David Goldblum. And as you can see here, a 10 joule treatment um, did a very, very nice job in, in uh, no, let me, let me rephrase this. This were two 7.2 joule treatments uh, within a few days, one from another. So a fractioned application of 7.2 and 7.2, it was 14.6 in total applied in two instances. And as you can see, in this case, very nice scar formation, count I. Now let's go into treatment. Let's say you want to perform such a puck cross-linking treatment, whether it is at the slit lab or in the laying position, what do you need to do? In the case of the CI device, you will see the profiles of the machine later. You would choose a profile that is high fluence and accelerate it. We have published five years ago already that you can accelerate puck cross-linking treatment without losing efficacy. You can go fast. Uh, why? Because this is not oxygen dependent. So as you can see here, this is the ulcer and the epithelium over the ulcer is dead. So don't take a scalpel, don't take a hockey, hockey knife, just a dry sponge to remove the dead epithelium. And this is your entryway into the cornea. Paolo Vinci Guerra has published a nice paper a few years ago um, that calls this um, the window absorption because it's like a window where the riboflavin can enter the cornea. So over this window you have an epioph and then you irradiate not only that window, you irradiate the entire cornea. So in fact you do a mixture of be off and it be on treatment. No scalpel needed. So that's in a nutshell how the particularity of a puck cross-linking procedure. Some years ago we developed a vision which is taking out corneal cross-linking from the operating theater which is expensive infrastructure and placing it onto the slit lamp which is the most simple common denominator we all share as eye doctors. After a few years of development, we uh, finally came out with uh, the CI device in 2020. And uh, this small piece of equipment gives you a large choice of different protocols using intensities of 3, 9, 15, 18 and 30 milliwatts. It can provide you with pulsed and continuous light regimens. It has an optimized beam profile. You can perform multiple procedures with one single charge. You can even use a power bank to charge it if needed. And most importantly, besides the modern application at the slit lamp, you can also perform classic CXL in the laying position with the same device. Now, during the development process of this machine, we looked at potential obstacles. And the main obstacles that uh, may uh, be encountered are the time irradiation needs and the potential risk of infection. Let's look at time first. If you try to perform a Dresden protocol at the slit lamp, 30 minutes might indeed be too long, but we all know now that in epi-off cross-linking for keratoconus in CXL, the 10-minute protocol, the slightly accelerated protocol works very well. And in puck cross-linking for infectious keratitis, we currently are at four minutes of treatment. And these irradiation times are feasible at the slit lamp without any major issues. You will see examples later. As for the risk of infection, if you look at any CXL or PAC CXL procedure, you never induce one only effect, you induce several effects. And these are biomechanical stiffening, steric hindrance, which means increased resistance to digestion, and then you stop replication by intercalating photoactivated riboflavin with DNA or RNA of anything that lives within the cornea. And lastly, you kill anything living in the cornea directly via oxidative stress. 
This happens in every cross-linking procedure, meaning that at the ends of a CXL for keratoconus procedure with an open surface and epi off, the cornea is sterile. So no need to mandatorily be in an operating theater. You can do this outside an operating theater too. And if you look at epi on procedures without the open surface, the risk of infection is even more reduced. So these two issues and obstacles have been overcome. Let's have a look at the different protocols the device delivers. We have prepared a number of preset protocols to cover all modern aspects of CXL and PAC-CXL. Let's uh, go through them. Let's start with these protocols. These are protocols for epi of crosslinking for keratoconus. As you can see, protocol one is the Dresden protocol. Protocol two is the slightly accelerated one. This is um, the fallback uh, protocol that can be used in many cases of keratoconus treatment. Protocol three is more accelerated, might be suitable for less aggressive forms of keratoconus. And finally, there is a pulsed um, a protocol that is uh, used quite a bit in Italy with 15 milliwatts. All these protocols deliver a total fluence of 5.4 joule. Now, switching to protocol 4, which is for PAC crosslinking infection. This is a high fluence protocol, continuous light, 30 milliwatts per square meter, so very high intensity for four minutes. Remember that some years ago, we were able to show that oxygen is essential for crosslinking. This is true for keratoconus treatment, for biomechanics, so you cannot go too fast. But in the contrary, for PAC-CXL, and we also published on this, you can accelerate without losing efficacy. That's why four minutes are sufficient here, and that's the time you can easily spend at the slit lamp. Let's go back to uh, CXL for keratoconus. This time, Epion protocols used with iontophoresis, no oxygen boost necessary. And, um, and the upper protocol is the one developed by Cosimo Mazotta from Italy and uh, is used quite extensively also. By the end of 2021, there will be one more uh, update, which is an epion without the need for iontophoresis. So please watch out for future developments. And the latest addition to our protocols is the long-awaited treatment of ultra-thin corneas. You might have heard uh, me speaking about uh, cross-linking corneas of 250 microns or even thinner in the last years at various congresses. This was based on an algorithm that we developed and published back in 2017. This was a mathematical model and then we went into a full clinical validation in a clinical study which was just published a few days ago in the American Journal of Ophthalmology. That's the SUP400 protocol. And here you can treat down to 210 uh, or even 200 microns of corneal stroma. So what you do is when choosing this protocol, you, you uh, apply the riboflavin, the ribocare for 10 minutes and then measure thickness with ultrasound perimetry. You get a minimal value and this value you put into the machine what is integrated in the machine is our published nomogram that then automatically chooses the right irradiation time and intensity for this thickness given. The CI device is the only cross-linking device on the market that has the SUP400 protocol integrated. How do you choose these protocols? Here's an example. It's very simple. Once you have switched on the device, you can move forward between the different example uh, between the different protocols. Go back, and once you're happy with your choice, you press OK, and then UV, and you can perform the treatment. One very important feature is the fact that we can easily update future protocols via the USB port and a firmware update. So you are not stuck with these protocols. If in two years there will be an exciting new protocol coming out, the machines can be updated and adapted. Now, let's have a look at one of the very first uh, slit lamp procedures performed in summer 2020. I will walk you through the procedure. It was a patient I treated, uh, I believe in uh, July 2020, with a very Clear, distinct cone, young patient.
As you can see, the patient is now laying in the half laying position here. But let's uh, let's uh, revisit the start. First of all, I make the patient really comfortable. You see that I gave the patient my surgeon's chair with the armrest, and I check the height. Take a minute or two to make the patient really be comfortable. That's very important. Okay. The next step was how can we? Uh, no, the next step is um, the first um, the simple irregular disinfection. I use uh, chlorhexidin and then I place the speculum that is contained in the CI procedure kit. It's a lightweight speculum that an open wire cruts care that will not pull down your lids in the sitting position. Here it is. And now I have the patient come forward. The next step is very important. How do we remove the epithelium? Of course, we can do it with a scalpel or a hockey knife, which is not that easy in the sitting position. Relatively easy for an experienced surgeon, but what about beginners? We came up, after more than a year of trying out, with this solution, which is tapping the corneal surface with a cotton but that was before soaked in 40% ethanol. And what happens then is you just tap in a circular manner for roughly 70 seconds. You may want to refresh um, and take a, a second um, cotton bud after half of the time. And then after 70 seconds, see what happens with the epithelium. This is very reproducible. You can create a very nice eight millimeter abrasion. Then rinse the eye in the vertical position, tell the patient that a little bit of BSS will run down the cheek. That's no big deal. Here's the rinsing. All these videos are also on our website. We then take the patient into the semi-lying position, into a reclining chair to apply the riboflavin for 10 minutes. 10 minutes are enough with ribocare. Before doing so, we measure thickness using an ultrasound perimeter, and we always have a perimetric map printed out so we know where more or less to expect the thinnest point. And then, as I said, we start, that's, uh, that was oxybuprocaine, and then we start with the riboflavin. Every two minutes for 10 minutes. Do not forget to remeasure thickness at the end of the 10 minutes. We haven't shown this here, because in case of a thin cornea, you will want to know where you are. Here, I'm scanning the tag of uh, the riboflavin, and then I'm positioning the patient uh, you see the white cap that is on top of the machine that is um, a, a barrier, a clean barrier between the eye and the machine. One last rinse, rinse off all the superfluous riboflavin. And then, if you have a positioning light of non your slit lamp, that comes in very handy because you give a target to the other eye. So you can very precisely position the patient's eye to be treated. I'm adjusting the diameter of the irradiation zone, which usually is around nine millimeters. And here the machine is already counting down. As you can see, it also counts up the fluids from zero to 5.4. And the patient is very steady. I'll show you examples afterwards. This is the view you have directly through the slit lamp. How do you find the right distance? Well, that's very easy. Before you switch on the UV light, you simply focus your image to the apex of the cornea, as you would do in any cornea assessment, and then you are in exactly in the right distance. We recheck perimetry, place a bandage lens, and uh, this is it. Now, this was a CXL4 keratoconus procedure. 
Now, a, a number of uh, skepticisms have uh, have arisen, uh, questions on, on the efficacy of the method in the sitting position. Let's have a look at them. The first is about the position itself. Many colleagues ask me, well, can you really perform cross-linking in the sitting position? Well, my answer is, why shouldn't we? Let's look at the factors that are needed for cross-linking. It's light, riboflavin, and oxygen. I think we all would agree that oxygen does not care whether the patient is sitting or lying, and light can be propagated horizontally and vertically, UV light, so that's no issue. The issue might be the riboflavin. If you sit, does the riboflavin gravitate downwards to the inferior cornea? Well, that's a legitimate question, and we have tested this and published some years ago. And uh, the short answer is, do not worry about gravitation, gravity. Why? Because you have one full hour before you can measure any relevant changes in riboflavin distribution between the upper and the lower cornea. It takes 60 minutes for the first few percent, 3.3% uh, of difference in riboflavin di distribution. So this is not really an issue. Another issue mentioned or concern mentioned by colleagues is fixation. Can patients really be at the slit lamp for so long? Please remember, 10 minutes for um, uh, keratoconus treatment, roughly four minutes for Paxi XL. Well, I have noted I've performed uh, roughly 60 to 70 uh, cross-linking procedures at the slit lamp in the past months, and I see that my patients are even calmer than in the laying position, because in the laying position, I often ask them to raise the chin so it's an unnatural head position, while, while as in, whereas in the sitting position, they are comfortable and they have a fixation target on the other eye. So have a look at the video on the left. I will start the video now. And as you can see, the only reason you know the video is running is because of the flickering of the screen. The patient is absolutely, uh, uh, absolutely uh, stable in its fixation. Now the right eye, the, uh, the right video, same thing here. And this is what we observe. You might have a micro saccade from time to time, but that's about it. The last issue is about, um, is the patient comfortable enough to stay at the slit lamp? Well, we have uh, interviewed every single patient since day one, and this is a typical response. Let me see whether you can hear it. Well, basically, <laughs> now I don't have the sound here. I was asking the patient whether he was comfortable, and uh, the patient's response was, yes, uh, the time spent at the slit lamp with some background music was easy, and fixation was easy. So we had no issues here. And in the end, the patient was giving us a thumbs up. I would like to speak about thin corneas, because this is clearly um, a clinical problem that we are facing again and again. And um, the 400 micrometer limit, of course, was established almost 20 years ago because the technical settings and the technical possibilities at the time allowed for a 3 milliwatt LED and uh, the Dresden protocol for 30 minutes. And so you could see the demarcation line down to a depth of a little more than 300 microns. So um, of course, we all now know that it's easy to, to cross-link uh, an early keratoconus cornea with a decent thickness of more than 400 microns of uh, stroma. But what about an advanced keratoconus with a thickness of 260 microns of stroma? And in order to solve that problem, we developed a number of different thin corneas protocol over the years. The first one came up in 2009. This was the protocol that we developed in Zurich, which is the swelling, hyperosmolaric or hypotonic crosslink. So, so a few years later, Susan Jacob developed contact lens assisted crosslinking. And uh, Cosima Mozotta in the same year proposed to leave islands of epithelium over the thinnest parts of the cornea. And um, let me show you why I do not swell my corneas anymore, like in 2009 and why I do not do contact lens assisted cross-linking anymore, because technology evolves. And I think both of these techniques, the one we uh, invented, the swelling, and the one Susan invented, the contact lens, have clear disadvantages. 
Why? Because on one hand, if you look on the one that we have established 11 years ago, the, the, the biomechanical stiffness was questioned two years ago, but a recent paper by Wollensack showed that stiffening is good in swelling. But there is another problem. The problem is that the, st the swelling of the cornea is very unpredictable. Some corneas swell immensely, other corneas almost do, do not swell at all. So I do not like surprises as a surgeon. And if I never know whether this cornea will swell decently or not, although I always use the same standardized approach, this is not good. And this is one of the reasons why we, about four years ago, were looking into alternatives to swelling. And um, why did we look for alternatives? There is contact lens induced, a uh, contact lens assisted cross-linking, right? But this technique also has a major disadvantage and Susan Jacob mentioned it. Um, I just want to precise that the paper that Sabine and I did five years ago did not show a better, or, uh, did not show a better effect uh, in thin corneas of, of stiffening only. It was a better effect in thin corneas without contact lens. Whenever we put a contact lens on it, we had 30% less efficacy. And Kega Wollensack has published the same thing last year. So I'm sorry, now you do not see all the transitions that would come with the slides. I just am in normal view. But we have, we have seen that, yes, contact lens assisted cross-linking works, but because it blocks so much oxygen, the efficacy is one third less. Why should I live with one third less of efficacy? This might be okay for early stages of keratoconus, but not for aggressive forms. So we completely left that field because until then, everything you've seen now, Susan's approach, our approach is modifying thickness. Wouldn't it make so much more sense to do it differently? Because the current approach, um, you, see the, you see the yellowish um, saturation of riboflavin down to three, the, the cross-linking effect is yellow. In the 400 micrometer cornea, we would do the Dresden protocol down to 330 or 40 microns, so the endothelium is safe. And in a cornea that is too thin, we would run into a problem. So we somehow modify thickness by swelling it, by putting a contact lens on, and so on. But this is not the most logical approach. You can modify thickness in a cross linking procedure. You could theoretically modify the riboflavin concentration. But the most logical approach would be to modify fluence for every single patient. So you do not care about swelling anymore. You do not care about the contact lens. You check the thickness of the patient and you adapt your total energy. Why didn't we do this 12 years ago? Simply because we did not know enough about the metabolism of riboflavin. We didn't even know oxygen was a solution and so on. But this is exactly what we have been doing. We try to keep it simple. So which means that we developed a protocol we call the sub 400 protocol, which is individualized cross-linking. This is not customized. Customized is something entirely different. Customized would mean more energy over certain areas of the cone to flatten the cone even more. Here, we have the same total energy, but adapted to the individual patient's thickness. So on the left, a 400 micrometer cornea receives Dresden protocol. A 310 micrometer cornea receives an adapted fluence. And the XX in red, we know these numbers. And we, as soon as the study is published, you will all have these numbers. And you can do the same thing in a 240 micrometer cornea. We published the algorithm three years ago. And now comes the beauty of it. It makes it very simple. We tested our algorithm in a prospective uh, monocentric study here at the ELSA Institute in Switzerland. Um, and now we have 47 eyes with a young one year follow up and look at the thinnest cornea. That's uh, stroma, 214 microns of stroma. Basically, what, what we see is not too much of a shift in stroma thickness throughout the imbibition with riboflavin. It's, it is hypoosmolaric riboflavin, but the sodium chloride content is modified, so you do not really swell a lot maybe 10 micrometers or 15. So you remove the epithelium, you put your riboflavin in, and then the trick is at the end of these 20 or 15 or 20 minutes, it's HPMC riboflavin, 
you measure your thickness and you get a number. And your, your number says 305 microns. And then basically once our paper will be published, you will have a table that tells you, oh, at 310 microns, you need these many minutes at three milliwatts or nine milliwatts to create a demarcation line that is 70 microns from the endothelium. This is our safety limit. So we have done this and the results are uh, quite surprising uh, in a positive way. So we didn't see any major changes in refraction or visual acuity, but we had a 2.1 uh, diopter significant decrease in Kmax and we had significant changes in the central three millimeters. What surprised me the most, I did not expect a success rate of almost 90% because we were in ultra thin corneas. I was expecting a success rate of maybe 80%, but this is, this is um, a very high success rate for now. And just look at these corneas. We are now cross-linking corneas like the one above at 220 microns, and you can see the demarcation line and, and it is exactly where we want it to be. No messing around with swelling or no swelling, no messing around with the contact lens, just adapt the fluence. All you need is an Excel table that you print out. So next step was, well, when if we can cross-link ultra-thin uh, keratoconus cornea, why don't we cross-link a keratoglobus cornea? This has never been done before. And we cross-linked uh, this cornea with a minimal thickness, um, I think in the sensor, of 210 microns. And whether you can trust the pentacam at uh, almost 80 diopters of KMX readings is one question, but we took multiple measurements and it seems as if at least the, the topography is, is stable in a, in a disease. Um, this, uh, we have two cases that was documented progressive before by five, six or seven diopters. And here we, we for sure with a two year follow-up do not see a progression anymore. Some colleagues ask us then, well, why would you cross-link a 230 micrometer cornea if uh, the patient has no satisfactory visual acuity anymore? And I would like to respectfully um, object because if you have ever seen what, what sclerol lenses can do to, uh, to an optics, it's just amazing. For example, take this keratoconus with a residual thickness of 108 microns of stroma an extreme compensation masking effect of the epithelium. And this patient had absolutely no functional visual acuity with glasses. He in fact was already on, um, on our uh, draft, uh, on our um, transplantation list. And then we gave it a try with this clever lens and the patient went up to 20, 30. So please do not forget, even with the central scar, there are two reasons why these patients do not see well. It's the opacification due to the scar, but it's also the massive irregular astigmatism. And using a sclerol lens, you decouple these two effects. You create a smooth surface and all of a sudden you will realize, oh, it's more the astigmatism. It's less the opacification of the scar that bothers the vision. So um, this is a nice example of uh, why cross-linking is so useful in our corneas. One last uh, sentence, uh, there is another proposed protocol um, that was published recently by a dear friend of mine, Cosimo Mazotta, the M protocol. Where is the difference? The difference um, is the following. Our sub-400 protocol has been redeveloped from the scratch. So it is, it is an algorithm that takes the thickness of the cornea and then breaks down how much fluence is needed using three milliwatts. Cosimo has done something very different. He has, he has put together all available solid literature on the depth of the demarcation line with different protocols. So he knows exactly how many, which protocol to use uh, to attend a certain thickness. That's a different approach. What I do not like too much about the approach is it makes, it makes the, the machinery more demanding, which means you cannot use the most simplistic three milliwatt machine, 10 year old or 15 year old. You need a machine that allows you to do uh, three, nine, 15, 30 milliwatts, continuous light, pulse light, even yontophoresis. Not everybody has all this machinery on board. Again, keep it simple. The sub 400, all you need is one type of riboflavin, 
and a three milliwatt machine. If you have a nine milliwatt, we also have that. We also have that covered in the second table, and based on the algorithm. So again, keeping it simple, I think the sub 400 will make it much easier and has clear advantages over our own swelling method and contact lens assisted cross linking. Now, in conclusion, we strongly believe that the CI device will democratize access to coronal cross-linking technology and CXL at the slit lamp is suitable for all indications and all modern techniques. So in brief, CXL at the slit lamp is the future of cross-linking. Thank you for your attention. Wow, uh, what a great presentation, uh, Farhat. It was really, really good. I mean, and we have a lot of questions. So if you don't mind staying here, I, I, I know that there's, uh, there's going to be more questions from the audience. But I would like to ask uh, Dr. Denise Pincus to coordinate the session for question and answer. So, Denise, if you want to come on board, I'm gonna put my, uh, I'm gonna put in silence my computer. Great, thank you, Professor Hefesi, for your talk. Um, I'm Denise Pincus. So we have some questions. Uh, people ask if you, if if in the protocol of the sub 400 uh, microns, did you have uh, any adverse events, some infectious keratitis? endothelial discompensation or every patient was okay? Uh, thank you, first of all, uh, very much one more time for the kind invitation and sorry for, we had one or two glitches in the transition of the video. My tech support apparently had problems um, putting it together 100%. Um, regarding the question, the sub 400 did not see any signs of endothelial decompensation. Why? Because what we simply did is if this is 400 microns, then we used the 5.4 joule. And the thinner the cornea got, the less uh, energy, total energy was used. So the demarcation line was always theoretically after the algorithm, 60 to 70 microns above the endothelium. So the total energy reaching the endothelium would always be the same, just like in the Dresden protocol. So no increased risk and clinically no decompensation. Great, perfect. Um, so what would you say is the role of pulled, uh, pulled slide cross-linking? Is it necessary when we do AP off or only an AP on? I mean, is it necessary or when do you recommend doing using the pulled light? I have been thinking a lot in the past weeks about creating one small presentation that puts all these factors into perspective. It's like maybe like driving a race car. You have more than one element that you have to control and they all play together, right? And in the end, you have the outcome you want. The central question is, is uh, are all three elements of the cross-linking reaction present in the cornea? Riboflavin? Um, light and oxygen. So what pulse does, it simply gives a little bit of time in the off pulse of, so no light, gives a little bit of time for oxygen to rediffuse into the cornea. This becomes essential when you accelerate the treatment to an extent where oxygen uh, demand gets critical, or when you have an epion procedure where, um, where the epithelium is another barrier. But even in epi off, let's say um, you do a Dresden protocol, you have no problem with the, with the oxygen. So pulse, yes or no, doesn't play a role. You do nine milliwatts, 10 minutes, you still have enough oxygen with constant light. But we showed already uh, almost 10 years ago and others have shown it too. If you go even faster, then you start losing efficacy because there's not enough oxygen. So theoretically, it would make sense to pulse even in epi off when you try to go very fast. In the end, you have to play with the speed of your, of your treatment, with the intensity of the treatment, the total fluence, and the rate of oxygen diffusion, and the effect where the epithelium is present or not present. And then you can just balance them out. So 
taking only one factor like pulsed, it's just a way to modulate oxygen concentration, but whether or not it's enough or not depends on all the other factors too. Great, thank you. Um, there's another uh, question about your device. Um, does it work with any riboflavin or I think that you, I mean, recommend one kind of riboflavin, correct? Well, it started with one kind of riboflavin. And if you look at the history of cross-linking, and I'm sure Dr. Shayet knows the same about the, the history of, of LASIK, it, it starts in one way and then it becomes more and more complex. And in the end, you try to um, simplify it again to make it, make it more accessible. Something similar has happened to riboflavin solutions. There was not really a reason to have so many different riboflavin solutions. It's partly artificial and not, and not made by the surgeons themselves. So we have spent almost two years with Eberhard Spörl, one of the two fathers of cross-linking, to go back to the roots and to create one riboflavin that can be used for epi-off and epi-on and iontophoresis application and as well for cross-linking. Because if you do not use a viscosity agent like Dextrain or HPMC, you can do iontophoresis with it. If you make the solution very, very slightly hypoosmolaric, you have a good penetration even in epi on with penetration enhancers. When, and when you up epi off, the viscosity agent does not play a major role and for puck cross linking either. So we boiled it down back to one single riboflavin. And this is what we've done. Great. So I think that the answer is obvious, but do you do epi on cross linking in any cases or in which cases do you do it? Um, I start doing them in many cases except the very aggressive forms. So if I have a if I have a 21 year old with a very distinct and clear and fast progression, I still do epi off. If I have a child for now, I do epi off. But um, we have switched to epi on about eight to nine months ago in many instances. But what we are trying to develop is I think Cosimo Mazotta has shown very nicely, we can overcome the oxygen, the, the boost in oxygen by having a clever combination of high fluence, pulse light and gentle acceleration. And I spent the last five months, a total of almost two weeks at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, trying to find out in the multi-photon microscope whether we can do um, an epi-on saturation of the cornea similar to iontophoresis without iontophoresis because Cosimo still has iontophoresis going on. So what we are developing right now in a prospective study is iontophoresis, um, is epi-on cross-linking at the slit lamp without iontophoresis, without additional oxygen. We have to see how efficient this is. Um, if not, we have to, um, we have to also uh, add uh, external oxygen, but we are in the process of comparing this. I'm quite confident that we should get to a good epi on without additional oxygen, without Yonto, for many forms of keratoconus, except the very aggressive uh, forms in the very young. Great. And do you uh, put... Um... When you're doing at the cross-linking at the slit lamp, do you put any drops during the UV light exposure, um, balance out solution or anything? Um, if, if we are at a, at a 10 minute treatment, we moisten the cornea after five minutes. We stop the treatment, patient leans back, and we moisten it. And something we, we wanted to test because it was an open question, does it make sense to put riboflavin during cross-linking? Because this would be a problem in the upright position. Right. So I had a postdoc checking this in a Dresden protocol, either no riboflavin at all or riboflavin every two minutes. Biomechanically, it does not make any difference. Theoretically, dropping is even contraproductive because you restart the cross-linking process in the superficial cornea with each new drop of riboflavin on the surface. But in, in practice, we couldn't uh, see any difference. So um, very simple, straightforward conclusion. We, we have submitted the work a few days ago. You do not need additional riboflavin during cross-linking. Great. And 
Are you currently using only uh, a slit lamp cross-linking or you still do it uh, not in the slit lamp? And what's the percentage of those both um, well, I'm, approaches? I'm, I'm clinically developing the slit lamp cross-linking. So I do right now maybe 95% at the slit lamp. We have a small mobile slit lamp that is dedicated for that. Um, in children that are too young to be stable, I don't do it. Um, we had, um, I had a very, very nice um, WhatsApp message uh, photo today from Boris Kneiser from Israel who showed me a patient with uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy in a wheelchair doing slot, slot, uh, slit lamp cross-linking. And he said, I would have had a hard time to put him um, in, um, onto the bed, it would have uh, demanded for much more infrastructure. So that's a nice example of the other way around. So for now, unless I use it in combination with a refractive laser procedure, then the patients are lying under the Eximer. Otherwise, I use the slit lamp approach. All right. And would you say that there's a difference about the cost? I mean, doing uh, cross-linking at the slit lamp with your device it's much, uh, I mean, about the cost in comparison, it's more available to our patients or the cost is about the same or it's cheaper. What, what do you think about that? Um, we developed slit lamp based cross-linking to democratize access on a global level. Um, there is a number of elements to it. First of all, the, the cost of the device should be very affordable in every country. Now, of course, everybody has national distributors. They do what they want to do, but they should align with what is done internationally. Second, we want to go out of the operating theater, which is a very expensive infrastructure. I've been doing my cross-linking for the past four years in the minor procedure room. You've seen the Exima laser behind. This is not a sterile operating room. I do my halation and the other minor surgery and the refractive laser in there. Um, and, um, and this is a way of driving down the cost. The third element is once we have Epion established, the doctor is needed for the very few minutes of the irradiation and the rest can be done, done applying drops will be done by the paramedical staff. So all these elements should help to drive costs down. And that's, that's a central element improve access in remote regions and at the same time drive costs down. It's probably similar in Mexico. The cost of a procedure room is only a fraction of the cost of an operating room. Correct, correct. And if doctors are interested in, in acquiring your device, um, how can they do it? Well, that's a good question, and I'm honestly not prepared to answer it. Um, but if if they want to, I'm I'm the I'm the advisor of Imagine, but I know that Imagine minus I dot com has a list of countries um, on the website with distribution, and uh, hopefully Mexico is on it. If if not, they can send uh, an email to Imagine, and they should be contacted soon. I I will briefly check while we we chat, but I. I'm almost positive that Mexico is on it or will be on it very soon. Uh, Dr. Hafezi, we have doctors right now from all over the world, so that's that's good. I mean, okay. maybe from Mexico, but we have, uh, actually I see Dr. Perry Binder from the United States. I think he's your friend, maybe. I, and please, Dr. Yeah. Dr. Noé Rivero from Argentina. So, Lovely. Yes. Uh, I think in Mexico, there my, my, my fellows are telling me that a company called Rocol. Maybe. Rocol, yes, right. I it's Rocol. They're, they're going to be distributing it. Yeah, I think the registration is almost done. Of course, it has to go to, through a national registration, but this should be a matter of a few weeks now. It's great that you have done this, and I like the fact that you have been doing this democratization. I think that, that our current president will love you because that's what he wants to, he, he wants <laughs> to do those type of things. So that's, that's <laughs> it's sounds, sounds uh, very good. And th that's what we tried with the SAP 400 protocol too. It is of course built into this device, but you can use it with any old machine. And that's why we chose three milliwatt for the first generation. By the way, the, 
the sub 400 was just published in the American Journal three or four weeks ago. So it's open access, everybody can use it. I think that's, that's quite important. And thank you for the kind words. All right, great, thank you. So we have a, a actual uh, question uh, from Dr. Noe Rivero. He asked, uh, Dr. Javesi, what do you think of the epithelializing, remember the epithelium, epithelium and performing cross-linking only in the ectatic area of the cornea? So we can avoid flattening uh, areas of the cornea that are already flat as is done in the original protocol in the central A millimeters of the cornea. Mm. Um, we, I remember that in the early days of cross-linking, we, we tried several of these things, but um, we shouldn't forget that cross-linking is a disease of the entire cornea and there's manifests on so over certain areas of the cornea. So I, I, I would prefer not to adapt the cornea to our method. I would rather prefer to adapt our method to the cornea. So I would prefer to do a more uniform approach and then play with the technical settings so we achieve the effect instead of doing it the other way around. Thank you. So before I ask some questions about uh, cross-linking for keratitis, so what is your, do you have like a current definition of keratoconus progression after doing cross-linking? Oh, I, it's, it's like looking into a, in, into a magic crystal ball. It, this is such a hard question to answer. What I'm most struggling right now, we have received um, the MS-39 already almost two years ago, the anterior segment OCT combined with the placido-based topographer. I don't know whether it is, it is available in, in Mexico. Yeah, also from Rockwell, I think. Okay, and, and, and so what we've seen is I, I've been relying on understanding progression on Scheinflug imaging for so many years, like, like we all did, but the camera image of a Scheinflug camera is disturbed by haze. And, and so all of a sudden, nothing I, I ever knew or believed in, in assessing progression, for example, after cross-linking, it can, can be trusted anymore because I see a massive, a massive increase in KMAX readings six months after cross-linking and I'd say, oh, I have a failure. Then I look at the, at the same patient's MS-39 at the anterior segment OCT topography and it's stable. And it was the haze that confused the machine, that confused the Scheinflug image. Um, so uh, I think we have to completely reassess what, what we judge as, as a progression. I'm not going into the debate whether it, KMEX is best, or one diopter is, is necessary or two. But if you see these images that are beyond a doubt progressive, where everything is red, and then the same patient in the same minute with another machine with another technology is totally fine. You have differences of four or five diopters. Then, then I think we have bigger problems right now in assessing our technology than these the, the more refined questions, uh, shall I take the mean of the central three millimeters or just one billion? Yeah, I think that-, that... I have one question, uh, Dr. Hafezi. In Keranet, over the last two days, they've been talking a lot about stabilization of RK with cross-linking. What's your experience? Um, what I have tried in two patients, and I'm still waiting uh, to see them back after six and 12 months, is um, I'm contradicting myself to what I said was before, because, but this is not a conus patient. I tried to do an annular peripheral high fluence cross-linking um, over the peripheral cornea close to the limbus while sparing the central cornea and leaving the epithelium on. Um, Maybe this will help flattening the periphery a little bit and, and just bringing the sensor up relatively soon. But I haven't seen the results yet. That's interesting. That's great. Thank you. Okay, so about cross-linking for infectious keratitis, is there any case that you do not recommend doing PAC cross-linking? In which cases? A viral keratitis. And for now, acantamoeba. Um, and so, in, oh, in, oh, yeah. 
in in all other cases, I would always perform a puck cross-linking, but just have realistic expectations. So what we have shown in the multi-center trial up to four millimeters, we were equivalent to medication, equivalent to antimicrobials. But if you go bigger, you will not be able to kill all the microorganisms with puck cross-linking alone. You always will need the medication, but at least you increase the tissue's resistance against digestion. And this is something no medication can ever do. The next, the next um, interesting thing that, that we are pursuing right now is riboflavin has a very good um, um, spectrum of action against bacteria, is also efficient against fungi, but a little less, and has a hard time in anganthamoeba. And uh, Rose Bengal is very efficient in acanthamoeba, has a spectrum that is, in, is, is efficient in, in, uh, in fungi, and I think that the bacterial drops off a little bit. What we are trying here is to combine both. So we have both irradiation sources now, and we start looking into combined procedure with riboflavin UVA and Rose Bengal green light in the same patient. And this is why we called it PUC crosslinking, photoactivated chromophore and not photoactivated riboflavin. Chromophore can be anything. Yeah. that is activated by light, like Rose Bengal. So I think we will see other variations of puck cross-linking, maybe even combinations that might be more efficient in certain areas. And for the pure riboflavin application, we had quite amazing results by tripling the fluence. We went up to 15 joule now, and the cornea still look okay, no decompensation. And we have much, much better responses in, in with 15 joule um, uh, applications and continuous uh, UV light exposure. Continuous not that's continuous light and yeah, yeah. All right. And so currently, are you also sometimes you use it as an ad, uh, adjuvant therapy with antibiotics or cross-linking only, or depends on every case. I think I think we used cross-linking only just for the trial because we needed to separate the effects, medication and cross-linking. As a clinician, I will use, I, I wouldn't call it a, a rejuvenant. I see it in smaller ulcers as a primary therapy, but of course I will continue giving, giving medication. But um, maybe you and me are in a lucky position because our patient will come back next week. But if you live in a remote country where the risk of not seeing the patient back again is very high, because the patient has simply no money to afford our consultation, then you increase the chance of the patient to be fine. Boris Kneiser has published on this with me and we've shown that additional puck cross-linking in bacterial ulcers reduces the time to healing quite massively, means less follow-ups. And in some, uh, in some countries of the world, less follow-ups means the patient can afford to do it. Great. And how about the cost comparing antibiotics only or cross-linking only? Um, this is exactly what I mean. If you look at the pure costs, um, talking to uh, people from other countries, they will tell you, why do we need this? Uh, antibiotics are dirt cheap. And again, it's, it's not the antibiotic. Patient has two, two possibilities in a low income country. Either go to the next pharmacy and he has a great chance of receiving steroids on a, or on a fungal infection or he goes to a, a specialist who wants to see him back once or twice. And this might be simply not feasible for the patient. So one single treatment uh, might indeed increase the chances of healing. Great. We have a question from Dr. Rogerio Sacramento. He says, Dr. Hevesi, what's your protocol for Fusarium? Um, Fusarium was, was, was one of the microorganisms we, we tested to better understand uh, the effect of puck cross-linking in fungal infection. And it seems as if similar to, to bacterial infections, we have to increase the fluence quite a bit. What we saw in bacteria, we went from 45% of efficacy in Dresden protocol to almost 100% efficacy um, with 15 joule. We published on this last year in Cornea. So right now we are doing the same. I could show you 
pictures of a patient where in with fungal keratitis, maybe I can pull it up, um, where we did 7.2 joule and 24 hours later, again, 7.2 joule. And the effect was quite amazing. So maybe I can pull it up, I'll see, but it, it, it really works nicely if you increase the fluence. Okay. And there is no big risk for the endothelium because the cornea is so opaque because of, uh, of the infection. So there's little UV light anyway that gets very, very deep. That's why we have to increase the intensity. Great, great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I don't know if Dr. Chayet, any last comments or any more questions? Thank you very much, Professor Hefezi. It was a pleasure. It was a great pleasure for me. Thank, thank, thank you, Denise, uh, for a great uh, discussion. And Dr. Hafezi, uh, perhaps I would like to show you uh, our fellow Dr. Luis Valdez. So Hi. I want to thank him for, he, he was the one who helped us, you know, coordinate. I know that he spent time with you in Switzerland. And yeah, it, it was a great pleasure having him with us. <laughs> thank you very much, Niki, and also Mark. Thank you very much for sharing your time with us and your knowledge. No, thank you so much. And, and we are so happy to see that you are in the best hands in Mexico now. And we are, we are excited to see the, the, the technology um, the technology spread also in, this, in the upright position. That's great. Okay. Hope to see you ne maybe next year. Hopefully someday physically, right? That would be lovely. Thank you. Uh, and also, uh, thank, thank you, Arturo. Nikki. I know that she's always with us. Yeah. Thank you. She's always there. And uh, thank you for everything. And we look forward to start using your, your equipment and your cross-linking. And I hope uh, everybody will follow. Uh, I think this is a great way of doing things very scientifically. So we really appreciate uh, everything that you have done in this area. And uh, it, it's, it's just uh, looking really good and very excited for the future. Thank you very much. Thanks for the kind words. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great evening. Goodbye, a great day. Thank you uh, to everybody who attended our webinar and uh, we we'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Dr. Apesi. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.